Three, two, one. Welcome to Antimatters. Hello everyone. Got something a little bit different today. I was surfing the old Tinder webs and I found a really, really good little section and it's all about ants' annual cycles. Things like nuptial flights and diapause and how they developed and a lot of things like that. And I thought, you know what? is so long that I don't think everyone's going to read it so I thought I'd read it out loud so that some people that decide I can't be asked to read it they can hear it as well because it's got loads of really useful information in helping you decide whether to put your ants into hibernation or what you're going to do and how it all works as well at the deep levels. So without further ado I'll get into it. The book chapter is called Structure, Diversity and Adaptive Traits of Seasonal Cycles and Strategies in Ants and was authored by Eleanor and was authored by Eleanor B. Lepatina from the Department of Entomology in St. Petersburg State University, the Russian Federation. Chapter 1. Introduction. The life of ants as cold-blooded organisms is closely connected with seasonal variations of ecological factors such as temperature, rainfall, humidity, availability of food, etc. varying during the year. Certain climatic changes usually manifest even in the tropics, causing the corresponding changes in behaviour and development of ants, as well as other insects. These changes are most pronounced in the northern regions with temperate and boreal climates. The annual changes of climatic conditions have a heavy impact on the life cycles of all organisms living here. In different ant species, various annual cycles of behaviour arise. They have been described in many reviews. However, the seasonality of the behavioural cycle in ant colonies is tied intrinsically to the seasonality in development processes such as oviposition, which is whether the queen is pumping out eggs or not, or if the colony is rearing larvae. Each ant species demonstrates certain annual developmental cycles because the process of the colony development cannot proceed without interruption during the whole year. To optimise the survival and growth of an ant colony, the entire warm season should be used for rearing larvae and for production of the greatest quantity of new adults. This is why the brood development should start in spring as early as feasibly possible and continue as long as possible into late summer. By autumn, only the brood stages that are able to survive during the winter should occur in the ant colony. To ensure this, special physiological mechanisms evolve which provide synchronization of the colony development with the yearly climatic periodicity. The first investigations devoted to the seasonality and the development of ants were performed by Joshikov who studied the phenology of the development in several ant species from central Russia. It's also studied by Headley, who characterised the seasonal development of two Leptophorax species and a Phenogaster fulva in North America. By Tolbert, who carried out the phenological study on two North American Myrmica species, and by Eidman, who described the hibernation in ants and mentioned that the Formica species overwinter without brood. Despite extensive studies of amphropod dormancy and seasonality, myrmecologists paid very little attention to the role of seasonality in ant ecology, as well as its effects on the evolution of the life cycle in these social insects. Literature on the topic is uncommon. There are very few publications specifically devoted to seasonal development and phenology of ants. As a rule, such data can be found in investigations dealing with the biology and ecology of certain species. Extremely rarely, the subject of the study was the regulation of annual cycles of the ants' development. Most often, seasonal variances were recorded accidentally and stood in the background of a paper pushed back by the main aims of the study. The seasonal development of the genus Myrmica, however, was studied to the greatest extent, mainly due to the works of N. Bryan. This paper contains a review of literary and proprietary data on the structure, diversity, adaptive features and evolution of seasonal cycles and strategies controlling the seasonal development of ants. 
We have studied the seasonal cycles in more than 80 species belonging to more than 20 genera from different regions of Russia and the former USSR, ranging from warm temperate to cold temperate and boreal climatic zones. Our field and laboratory studies have allowed us to map the diversity of annual cycles to reveal the underlying eco-physiological and social mechanisms of control and to develop ideas on possible pathways for the evolution of the seasonal cycle in ants. The main study methods we have used were laboratory experiments and field phenological observations. That's the study of seasonal biological changes, for example egg-laying waves, nuptial flights or hibernation in ants. In experimental studies, the ant colonies were divided into fragments each consisted of workers, queens and the brood. In the case of a small number of workers in the colony, or for monogamous species with a single queen in the nest, entire natural colonies were used. Colony fragments, or the whole colonies in some cases, were kept in artificial plastic nests, which were randomly distributed over various experimental regimes, including different photo periods, which is the time they're lit, and also either varying or constant temperatures. The experimental regimes were maintained in a special thermostatic unit as well. Our methods of laboratory cultivation of ants provided the opportunity to observe and to study all stages of their annual cycle, including overwintering in a refrigerator under the temperatures of 3 to 5 Celsius. Chapter 2 Peculiarities of Seasonal Development in Ants as Social Insects In social insects, in addition to the life cycle of the individual ant, there is the life cycle of the colony as an integrated superorganismic system. It consists of the processes of the development of individuals, but it is not equivalent to several ants simply being grouped together as a whole. Social regulation mechanisms arise in the evolution and are realised through interactions between members of the colony. They control the physiological state and the development of individuals, depending on the ecological situation and colony needs. Such collective regulation of development is absent in solitary species and largely determines the specificity of seasonal development in the ants. Colonies of ants are not only perennial, but usually have extended lifespans under favourable conditions of environment. Not only queens, but even workers, can survive for several years. In monogamous species, all workers and the brood are the offspring of the only queen. So, while the queen is alive, all of the population of a colony can relate to one and the same genetic generation during consistent years. They all come out the same mother. In polygamous species, with several queens in a nest, all individuals inhabiting a single colony may pertain to various generations, or mothers, which overlay each other. However, the seasonal life cycle of the colony is not associated with differences that arise between mothers. It embraces the regular seasonal variations in the physiological state of all individuals in the colony, which entail the orderly changes in behaviour and developmental patterns. Therefore, we determined the seasonal life cycle of an ant colony as an annual cycle of physiological behaviour and development. After spring awakening, the queen commences laying eggs. The development of larvae also begins and pupae appear. There are workers and reproductive individuals among new adults. Egg laying and brood development continue throughout the warm period of the year and cease in the autumn. When ants begin to prepare for wintering, they go to special shelters and spend the winter in an inactive state. The annual cycle of colony development is a collective and highly organised process and includes the individual development of immature stages, the brood, and regular seasonal changes in the physiological state and reproductive activity of adults, workers and queens. This is why the growth and development and the beginning and termination of diapause in ants 
can be considered and studied both at the individual level and at the level of the entire colony. And these are not the same thing. Since all these processes are under the control of the mechanisms of social regulation and integrated reactions of the colony to the changes in environmental conditions. In this connection, diapause of ant larvae can and usually happens optionally in response to circumstances rather than by nature at the level of an individual but at the same time obligatory at a colony level in endogenous heterodynamic species. Endogenous species put themselves to sleep through processes within the ant. Think Campanota species, basically. Chapter 3. Homodynamic types of seasonal development. If you were looking for places where there is insufficient study on the phenology in ants, the tropical regions of the earth would be especially prominent. Analysis of meagre data shows that at any time of the year, in the nests of most tropical species studied, all the stages of ontogenesis, or brood, from the egg to the pupa are present, and development retardations are absent. They don't slow down. <laughs> Such continuous all-year-round development, without the obligatory onset of periods of physiological dormancy, we call homodynamic. However, homodynamic species often have a certain seasonal structure of the annual cycle. On a general background of continuous development, there may be significant seasonal fluctuations in the numbers of certain brood stages, as well as seasonal association of the rearing of elates and nuptial flights. Some examples of this variety in Catalogus guineasis from Ghana, the brood population has two peaks, in May and in September. The elate females and males are numerous in the nest in July to October, and the rest of the time there are few to no elates at all. The larvae of elate reproductives of Campanotus cerasius in India develop from October to July and elate females and males can be found in the nest all year round in this species, but their nuptial flight occurs in September to October. Colonies of the tropical ant Paltophoreus tarsatus from the Ivory Coast grow elate females in spring and males in autumn. Reproductives live in the maternal nests for a very long time and leave for mating only in February. In definitive periods of the year, elates of Anapolepsis longiceps, black crazy ants I think, are grown up in Papua New Guinea and in the Seychelles. The factors that cause such seasonality in tropical species are not yet clear. In addition, periodicity of egg production was noted for a number of species, for example in the natural colonies of Anapolepsis longiceps, Catalorcus guineasis and a species of Rhinotopanera, there are two egg abundance maxima throughout the year. Rhythm of egg production was also found in a tropical species, Linapitema humile, widespread in southern France, both in natural and laboratory conditions. The periodicity of egg laying is also a characteristic feature of the nomadic ants of the, of the tropical subfamily, Dolorus, and especially of the neotropical species. In all species, the cyclic brood rearing is clearly associated with behavioural cycles. Oviposition slash egg laying occurs during a stationary phase, which alternates with a nomadic phase, during which the ants feed the larvae that emerge from the eggs. The homodynamic development of some tropical ants was observed in the laboratory. G. Terran maintained colonies of the African species Tetrapanera anthracina at 25 to 26 Celsius for several years and reported that development of the brood occurred continuously and reproductives periodically appeared. But he observed alternating periods of egg laying and reproductive dormancy of, que of the queen. Pharaoh ants, a widespread invasive species which was imported from tropical Africa to Europe and North America, now inhabits many heated buildings. It was found in the nests 
of this species under optimum conditions, 27 to 30 Celsius, at 60 to 65% humidity. These are the scientifically determined optimum conditions, if you want to keep pharaoh ants, by the way, so, yeah. <laughs> Brood developed continuously with cyclic rearing of a late reproductives at regular intervals. We also kept several colonies of pharaoh ants found in St. Petersburg in the laboratory for two years and revealed that any temperatures above the threshold, which is 17.7 .7 to 17.8 degrees in this species, brood development occurred without any delays. However, at a near threshold temperature of 17 Celsius, the mortality rate of all brood categories, as well as adult ants, sharply increased, and the colonies died within a month. Thus, this tropical species cannot tolerate even short periods of temperature decrease, which was confirmed by the available data on its habitation in Europe only in heated buildings. We observed homodynamic development in two species from the tropics, Fidole sexpinosa from the Tonga archipelago and Tetrabonera semilillium from the Seychelles. We kept them in the laboratory for more than a year, varying the temperature and photo periods within acceptable values, i.e. within those that can be observed in the natural habitat of these species. 18, 25 Celsius, 10 to 16 hours of light per day. All this time, there was continuous development in the colonies. It is well known that typically tropical insects cannot survive for a long time at temperatures well below the optimum and especially below the developmental threshold. Therefore, it can be argued that the tropical ants, in their majority, are not adapted to survive during the cold periods of the year. However, some ant species can demonstrate continuous all year round development even in subtropical environments. For example, in the central regions of Texas, Pseudomermex species occupy the stems of a mimosa and all brood stages are present year-round, but in different amounts. Eggs and larvae are numerous in winter and pupae in spring and summer. Thus, we can assume that the development and pupation of larvae of this species continues in winter, but much more slowly than in summer. This decrease of brood developmental rate leads to a significant decline in the number of pupae in the wintering nest, according to Rissing. New workers of Mesa Pagande in Arizona, the United States, appear from pupae also throughout the year. Chapter 4. Heterodynamic Cycles of Development Annual developmental cycles of ant colonies in which a diapause arises naturally, we call heterodynamic. They have a distinct seasonal structure. The period of diapause, the phase of dormancy, is regularly replaced by the period of development, the active phase of the cycle, after which a new period of diapause occurs, and so on. Generally, the phase of dormancy in the annual cycle coincides with the period of unfavourable climatic and or food conditions. It is characterised by a lack of larval development and, as a rule, of queen ovi position, so the queen will stop laying eggs, and the presence in the nest of only certain, usually diapausing, brood categories. During the active phase of the annual cycle, Eggs are laid and the larvae are reared. Ants grow up new workers, as well as the late females and males. Chapter 4.1 Quasi-heterodynamic development Some ant species recently penetrated from the tropics or subtropics to areas with a warm temperate climate and successfully settled there. Two species of fire ant, Solenopsis ricteri and Solenopsis invicta, were imported to the United States from South America. The first one around 1920 and the second one in the early 1940s. Invicta significantly expanded its original range fairly far north and is now prevalent in most southeastern states. The distribution of Solenopsis riccari is limited mainly to the northern parts of Alabama and Mississippi and the southern parts of Tennessee. Several authors have shown that in southern United States 
Mississippi, Florida, South Carolina, etc., both fire ant species remain essentially homodynamic. Eggs larvae and pupae of workers are present in the nests all year round. However, the number of immature stages varies considerably during the year, and in winter it is very small. In February to March, the numbers of eggs increase sharply, and new larvae develop, and begin to pupate in April to workers and May for a late. At this time, the quantity of brood categories is maximal and reaches 40 to 45% of the entire biomass of the colony. Reproductive individuals appear from pupae in June and fly out of the nests at least five times during the summer. The second small peak of brood population, up to 35% of the biomass in the nest, coincides with the first cooling in September to October. At this time, all larvae and pupae belong only to the caste of workers. In November to December, the number of larvae and pupae sharply decrease and reaches a minimum, less than 2% of the biomass of the colony, in January. Thus, the number of immature stages in the fire ants directly depends on the environmental temperature. It has been determined that in the most northern populations of Solenopsis invicta, oviposition and brood development are suspended in the coldest months, i.e. eggs and pupae are absent in the nests in winter, it can be assumed that there is no diapause of larvae in the fire ants and larval development ceases only when the ambient temperature falls below the developmental threshold, which is about 17 Celsius, according to laboratory experiments. We can also assume that many eggs, larvae and pupae, as well as adult ants, die during the winter in northern populations of this species. The winter mortality of Solenopsis and Victor workers was noted in several works. Nevertheless, the colonies successfully survive in these conditions. Consequently, these ants already have some physiological adaptions that allow them to tolerate a sufficiently long stay at low temperatures. Such tropical species, adapted to live in regions with cold winters without forming real diapores, we call quasi-heterodynamic. They are characterised by the potential for unlimited long development under favourable conditions inherent in homodynamic species, the development of their brood ceases only at temperatures below the developmental threshold, and ants spend the winter in a cold coma state, suffering from high mortality rates. In general though, the colonies overwinter successfully. The Argentine ant demonstrates another example of quasi-heterodynamic development. This tropical species was imported from South America and is now widespread in many parts of the world. Its phenology, investigated in the USA and in Europe, is very similar to the seasonal development of fire ants. In the southern parts of California, only a few larvae of workers and a very few eggs can be found in the overwintering nests of the species. At this time of year, more than 90% of the colony's biomass is made up by adult ants. The new seasonal cycle begins in late February to early March, when the queens start to lay eggs. The larvae hibernated in the nests complete their development by the middle of March. In summer, brood makes up about 50% of the colony's biomass, but in October its number decreases sharply and gradually reaches its minimum by December. On the southern coast of France, the Argentine ant has similar phenology. Most small larvae hibernate in the nests, but in small numbers, and there are also some medium and large larvae. Very rarely there are also eggs. Renewal of development is observed in March. Since the fire ants and Argentine ants recently permeated to the areas with cold winters, we tend to think that they do not yet have diapause. However, it has been experimentally determined that only the overwintered colonies of the Argentine ant can grow up a lot of late females, which appear in the nests in South France at the beginning of the summer season. This suggests that there are seasonal changes in the physiological state of colonies that are similar to diapores. According to the literature, many subtropical ants do not have any brood in their nests during the winter. 
For example, Panera, Pennsylvania, in the state of Missouri. However, without experimental laboratory studies, it is impossible to conclude whether all of them are quasi-heterodynamic and overwinter without brood due to its death, or conversely, they have a stable winter diapause of the queens, i.e. belong to the group of true heterodynamic species. We discovered and investigated quasi-heterodynamic developmental cycles in several ant species living in the regions with subtropical and warm temperate climates. In the colonies of Tetramorian Nipponese and Pachyclonda chinesis, which were collected in the south of Japan and were kept in the laboratory at temperatures of 25 to 27 Celsius and a photo period of 16 hours of light per day, the oviposition of the queens and the development of the pupation of larvae did not cease during the year. After a gradual decrease in temperature, the colony successfully overwintered at 7 to 8 Celsius. At the same time, however, all of the brood died, which probably occurs during the overwintering in natural conditions of the south of Japan. In the experiments on Monomorium kuznikoskovi from Turkmenistan, the growth, development and pupation of the larvae continued uninterruptedly at temperatures exceeding the developmental threshold of 20 Celsius for eggs and 21.5 Celsius for larvae and pre-pupae. Thus the larvae of this species do not have diapause, which is a sign of quasi-heterodynamic seasonal cycle. At 20 Celsius, the larvae ceased growth but the ov position did not stop, and by the beginning of overwintering, eggs and larvae of all ages were still present in the nests. However, eggs, as a rule, did not survive during hibernation in the laboratory, but the larvae hibernated more successfully. We assume that in natural conditions, these ants go on hibernation with eggs and larvae, but eggs and part of the larvae die during the winter. In the middle of April, in central Kopeg Dag, when we dug out the nests of Monomorium, we always found small packets with eggs and larvae of younger instars and a small number of the third instar larvae lying separately. Instars, by the way, are kind of the stage that they're molting, like every molt, if they molt, they'll get like the next instar sort of thing. These larvae lying separately began to pupate at this time of the year. Obviously, these larvae overwintered in the nest. But the eggs could appear in early spring. Thus, it seems likely, though not completely proved, that a certain number of eggs can be preserved in the nest until spring. Two Fidole species, Fidole pallidula and Fervida, were collected in Turkmenistan and Russia where they inhabit the regions with temperate climates. They also prove to be quasi-heterodynamic. Fidode pallidula is common in southern Europe, the Caucasians and South Asia. The distribution area of Fidole favida includes Southeast Asia, Japan, Southern Kurils, and the south of Primary. I have no idea how to say that or where that is. In Primary spelled P-R-I-M-O-R-Y-E, Favida probably survived from the tertiary period, when the climate there was much milder. In our experiments with both species, the queens continued to lay eggs and the larvae developed and pupated at any temperature exceeding the developmental threshold. That's about 18 Celsius for Fidole pallidula, if you're wondering. Any forms of diapause were absent. Under optimum conditions at 25 to 28 Celsius, we observed continuous development for two or more years. For Fidole pallidula from Turkmenistan, we found that when the temperatures decreased to 20 Celsius, the queen's productivity declined significantly, but queens did not stop laying eggs, and the larvae developed and pupated. At a temperature of 17 Celsius, which is only slightly below the developmental threshold for eggs and larvae, oviposition continued, but the eggs did not develop. Pupae and pre-pupae were the first to die, and then all brood stages gradually perished. 
Consequently, it could be assumed that in nature all brood in the nest of this certain species die even before the beginning of winter. Our field studies in Turkmenistan have shown that there was no brood in the nests of Fidole paludula in early spring. It appeared later from the eggs laid by the queens. This is confirmed by observations made by Perserva in the south of France. Fidole favida is somewhat better adapted to the temperate climate in the south of Primary. <laughs> and its brood probably dies out only partially during overwintering. In our experiments with autumn colonies of this species, even at temperatures of 17 Celsius and under short day conditions, 10 hours of light per day, the queens continued laying eggs and larvae still pupated. We maintained one colony in which there were originally more than 100 larvae of different sizes under these conditions for seven months. Over this time, some of the larvae perished, but more than half of them pupated. This situation was strikingly different to the one we observed. This situation was strikingly different from ones we observed in similar experiments with truly heterodynamic ants. In most cases, at 17 Celsius, the development very quickly ceased due to the onset of diapause. When we decreased the keeping temperature for the autumn colonies of Favida, up to 10 to 12 Celsius, the workers began to dismember and to throw out the prepupae and pupae from the nest and gradually destroyed them all. There were only eggs and larvae of all instars in the nest. However, part of the eggs and larvae of the first and second instar perished during the hibernation in the refrigerator at 3 to 5 Celsius, while the older larvae overwintered more successfully. It would be extremely interesting to compare the population of the colony of this species in late autumn and early spring to assess the ability of the larvae to survive during the winter in the natural habitats. Probably the similar regulation of the seasonal developmental cycles exists in Fidole morrissey as well, which hibernates with larvae in the north of Florida. Chapter 4.2 True Heterodynamic Development Most temperate and all boreal climate ants are true heterodynamic. They possess real winter diapause in their annual cycles. The presence of this diapause provides a more successful wintering by increasing the physiological resistance of larvae and adult ants to unfavourable winter conditions. In the literature, there is practically no data on the tolerances of developing and diapausing larvae, other developmental stages, and adult ants to low temperature and other unfavourable environmental factors. Plateau noted that Temnophorax nylandieri, in their active physiological state, could not successfully overwinter. When he put summer colonies of this species into the refrigerator, Eggs, prepupae and unpigmented pupae quickly died and began to rot, causing the death of the entire colony. Similar results were obtained in our experiments with colonies of Lassius niger, Lepisota seminovi, Myrmica rubra, Myrmica rubra nodis, and Plagiolepsis compressus, which we put in the refrigerator at temperatures of about 5 Celsius in summer. Eggs, prepupae and pupae died within one to three weeks, but larvae remained alive. True heterodynamic seasonal cycles occur in the vast majority of ant species living not only in temperate and cold climates, but also in subtropics and even the tropics. The presence of long-term developmental delays was noted, for example, in all five species from the Rhinotipanera impressa group widespread in the forests of eastern Australia. These species demonstrated a strict seasonality of development. During the winter months, only small and medium-sized larvae and very rarely eggs were found in the nests. This situation was observed both in subtropical and tropical regions of Australia. It is clear for the occurrence of heterodynamic development in the tropics Seasonal changes in environmental conditions have to exist. 
since the annual rhythm of the climate is usually quite distinct in the tropical regions, and its absence, on the contrary, is very rare. Heterodynamic seasonal cycles should probably be widespread in tropical ants. Hibernation and diapause are widespread in tropical insects, but mechanisms of the regulation of the heterodynamic cycles in the tropics are far from being understood or explained yet. It should be assumed that heterodynamic development is more common for ants in subtropics because the seasonal rhythm of the climate there is much more pronounced than in tropical zones. Indeed, most of the subtropical species studied demonstrate the cessation of development in winter. Some of them do not have brood, while others overwinter with larvae. However, it is impossible to decide without special experiments whether these subtropical ants possess a real diapause or they are quasi-heterodynamic and stop their development during the cold season due to direct influence of the low temperature. Chapter 5. Seasonal Strategies of Brood Rearing in Heterodynamic Ants Analyzing the structural diversity of heterodynamic seasonal cycles in ants, we identified two fundamentally different directions in their evolution and accordingly two seasonal strategies for brood rearing. Chapter 5.1 The Strategy of Prolonged Brood Rearing The ants are more likely to follow the strategy of prolonged brood rearing. This strategy is based on the ability of larvae to enter into a diapause state and to continue development over the next summer. Depending on the composition of the overwintering brood and the stage at which diapause is observed, we distinguish two structural types of developmental cycles. A phenogaster type. Larvae fall into a diapause at the end of summer and all the remaining pupae manage to complete the development before the onset of colds. But the queens have no diapause and do not cease egg laying until late autumn. Therefore, not only diapause larvae, but also eggs and young larvae overwinter and survive, at least partially. Thus, the formation of the wintering population of the colony is determined by the appearance of larval diapause in species with this type of seasonal cycle. These species are apparently limited in their distribution to the subtropics and the southernmost regions of the temperate zone. The Myrmica type. The diapause starts both in larvae and queens at the end of summer. Therefore, before winter comes, larvae emerge from the laid eggs and all the pupae develop into adults. The overwintering brood is represented only by larvae. These annual cycles are typical for most ant species living in a temperate climate zone. The induction of diapause in both larvae and the queen plays an equally important role in the synchronization of Myrmica type cycles with the annual rhythm of the climate and in the formation of the wintering composition of the colony. The annual cycles of ants that overwinter with brood have the most complex seasonal structure. They create the first peak in the number of pupae in the nest. As a rule, a late females and males develop from most of them. Some of the larvae that emerge from the eggs, which were laid in spring and early summer, can pupate during the same growing season. This is the so-called rapid or summer brood, according to M. Ryan. It develops without diapause and gives the second peak in numbers of pupae. All other larvae that emerge from eggs within the season left fall into a diapause, hibernate and finish their development only next summer. This is so-called a slow or winter brood. Thus, two complete cycles of brood development from the egg to adult take place in a colony during each year. A summer cycle that begins and ends within one growing season and a winter cycle in which larval development is interrupted by their diapause. Rapid brood is found in most species from the temperate zone. It may be absent in species and populations from the northern regions, where summer is short, as well as in species with very slow individual development. For example, the rapid brood is absent in Ambliopone palipsis from Massachusetts. I've massacred that. 
it can be assumed that this species is characterised by very slow development, although there is no data on this problem. The Japanese ant, Leptomanilla japonica, has an extremely specialised annual cycle without rapid brood. The queen lays the only portion of eggs at the end of July to the beginning of August. The larvae develop over winter at the last instar and pupate in July of the following year. They develop very synchronously, so at each moment there is only one stage of brood in the nest. Adults emerge from pupae at a time when larvae appear from the next portion of eggs. Thus, in spite of the fact that this species lives in a subtropical climate, only one cycle of brood development occurs during a year. I find that quite incredible to be fair. The strategy of prolonged brood rearing is extensive inherently, as it is realised by stretching of the development of individuals for two or more summer seasons. The appearance of larvae's ability to fall into a diapause gave the ants a unique way for adaption for the life in a temperate climate and especially at high latitudes. Therefore, the strategy of prolonged development is most common among the ants living there. It has a number of adaptive advantages. Chapter 5.1.1 More complete use of a favourable period for the development and available thermal resources. Since the larvae are always in the nest, the workers can feed them from early spring to late autumn. Immediately after the end of winter, as soon as it becomes a little warmer, the ants carry the larvae from the underground chambers to the upper areas warmed by the sun. This creates the best opportunity for larval growth and development. As it becomes warmer and the amount of available food increases, the ants carry more and more small larvae to the upper levels of the nest to join the bigger larvae which they take first and they begin to feed them. According to Pekin, for Lassius flavus, the overwinter larvae of the first and second instars remain in the deep and cold nest chambers for the longest time and therefore complete their development only by the end of summer. The same was recorded for Temnophorax nylandari. In the spring, the workers of this species also start with the feeding of the largest overwintered larvae which develop into a lates. The autumn period of larval rearing is also of great importance for most ants with a wintering brood. For example, in the central part of European Russia, in the colonies of Myrmecarubra, the pupation of larvae ceases, as a rule, in the first half of August, due to the onset of larval diapause. However, until the middle of September, the larvae continue to hatch from the remaining eggs to grow and develop. New third instar larvae appear and soon fall into diapause. Moreover, in Myrmica, diapausing third instar larvae retain their ability to feed and to grow slowly without the development of imaginal buds, and therefore they continue to gain weight in the autumn period. The same autumn growth of the last instar larvae was also observed in Leptophorax species. According to our data, larval growth in diapause state is a characteristic feature primarily for species in which larvae enter into a diapause and overwinter in the last or all instars. Thus, in the species using the strategy of prolonged brood rearing, workers are engaged in feeding of larvae until the final onset of cold weather and give them all the surplus food produced during this period minus the amount of nutrients that the workers accumulate in their fat. This makes it possible to maximise the total mass of the wintering brood and consequently to grow up the first workers next year as fast as possible, as well as reproductives. Next spring, in addition, the biomass accumulated by larvae is also a reserve of nutrients for the colony. In the case of food shortage, Ants can eat a part of the brood, mainly eggs and small larvae, in order to survive and to feed the largest larvae. Chapter 5.1.2 
the ability to adapt to the duration of the warm period of a year by changing the amount of rapid brood. Such adaption path can be realised during the penetration of the ants into more northern areas and in connection with the local variability of climatic conditions from year to year. In the north, where the summer is short and heat resources are limited, the ants can grow much less rapid brood than in the south. For example, in the south of France, Temnophorax unifasicus unifasiatus has numerous rapid brood, and in cooler Belgium, only small amounts of it. According to our data from Lassius niger, Lassius flavus, Myrmica rubra, Myrmica rugonodis, and Myrmica scabronodis, from the central part of European Russia, all overwintered larvae pupate in the spring and in the first half of summer, and then a numerous rapid brood larvae also pupate. Simultaneously, at the latitude of St. Petersburg, where the warm resources available to the ants of these species are much less, usually only a small part of the larvae emerging from the eggs pupate during the same summer. In the far north, where the summer is even shorter and the warmth is even less, the ants generally never have rapid brood. This is demonstrated in our studies of Leptophorax, Acervorum, Acervorum and Myrmica Kamschnatika from the upper reaches of the Kolimar River and Myrmica rubra and rugonodis from the coast of the White Sea near the Arctic Circle. Similar changes in the amount of rapid brood occur when the average summer temperature increases or decreases from the year-to-year -year average. For example, in a cool summer, Temnophorax nylandari may have no rapid brood, although it is usually quite numerous. We observed the same in St. Petersburg region for Lassius niger, Leptophorax acervorium, Myrmica rubra rugonodis and scabronodis, in colonies of which there was no rapid brood in cool years, and even some larvae could stay for repeated overwintering which means these larvae are being larvae for years, which is incredible as well. Chapter 5.1.3 The ability to stretch the development of larvae for two or even three summer seasons. Oh, this is going to get good now. Lack of thermal and or nutritional resources during the summer is not an uncommon situation in areas with cold temperate climate. As a result, the overwintered larvae that do not reach the size sufficient for pupation fall into a diapause repeatedly and hibernate for a second time. Repeated overwintering of some larvae was noted for Temnophorax nylandari, Leptophorax acervorum, and Myrmica rubra, along with many other species. We observed this phenomenon in our experiments with Aphenogaster sinensis, Campanotus herculanus, Campanotus traponicus. Campanotus aphiops, Lassius niger, flavus, leptophorax species, and Manica, Manica rubida, Myrmica rubra, and Myrmica rugonodis. The possibility of repeated larval hibernation is of particular importance for ants living in the far north with an extremely short summer. According to our data from Myrmica camschnatica and leptophorax acervorum, from the upper reaches of the north Colimar River, all wintering larvae pupate in the warm years, but only part of them if the summer is cold. However, the number of larvae repeatedly overwintering probably cannot be significant in the colony. This is hampered by some social factors that limit the possible changes in the structure of the, of the seasonal developmental cycle when the ants penetrate into more northern regions. Therefore, ants never go over to the opportunistic strategy of stretching development for several years so typical for many boreal and antarctic insects. This feature restricts the further spread of the ants to higher latitudes. Chapter 5.2 The Strategy of Concentrated Brood Rearing i.e. Formica type 
This strategy presumes the obligatory completion of the development of larvae emerging from the eggs during one summer season, i.e. is typical for species that hibernate without brood. We named such annual cycles as formicotype since they were first described for ants of this genus. Diapause in larvae is absent, but it arises in queens at the end of summer, long before the autumn cooling. Therefore, even the eggs laid by the latter have time to complete the development. All adults emerge from pupae before cold weather comes on, and the ants prepare to overwinter. We can say that all brood is rapid in these ants. After the onset of queen diapause, new eggs don't appear, and all existing brood gradually completes development. The diapause of queens should not occur too early, otherwise the period available for brood development would actually be reduced. Simultaneously, if diapause arises too late in the season, many larvae and pupae could be caught by the onset of winter and destroyed by the cold. This is why the moment when the queen enters into a diapause is the most important time for the formica type of annual cycles. From the point of view of using available heat resources, the strategy of concentrated brood rearing is less effective than the strategy of prolonged development. It can be realised in a temperate climate zone where summer is short. Only in combination with increased brood developmental rates, i.e. by intensifying developmental processes, which becomes extremely important for northern species and populations living in areas with a particularly short summer, our studies have shown that this is really so in Cataglyphus and especially in Formica. Individual developmental rates are significantly higher than in most species with hibernating larvae. Among northern ants, Formica species have the shortest developmental times and develop almost twice as fast as Myrmica and Leptophorax. All six Formica species which we have studied were very similar in the duration of ontogenesis and the temperature sensitivity of the development. Moreover, the development of Formica is much more thermal sensitive than in Myrmica. Due to relatively higher temperature thresholds and a higher coefficient of linear regression of the developmental rate on temperature, which allows Formica ants to rear brood, especially intensively at higher temperatures. According to our data, at temperatures of 25 to 26 Celsius, close to the optimum temperatures for Formica species, their developmental time from egg to pupae is only 20 to 25 days, while it is 34 to 35 days in Myrmica rubra. Moreover, at temperatures optimal for Myrmica rubra, about 22 Celsius, their developmental times from the egg to pupae is 40 to 45, i.e. almost twice as much as Formica species. Thus, in Formica, brood rearing really occurs more intensively in concordance with our observations from Servi Formica species in European Russia. Their development from egg to the adult can be consistently realised two or three times over summer, i.e. these ants can rear two or three large batches of brood every year. In Myrmica species, only one full cycle of development, rapid brood, passes in the colony during the summer season. The larvae of the second cycle enter into diapause, overwinter and finish development next summer. Thus, it can be assumed that raised rates of ontogenesis in Formica species completely compensates for the shortcomings of the strategy of concentrated development and allows to significantly increase the total amount of brood reared in the temperate climate during the summer. So far, however, it is difficult to say whether such a high rate of ontogenetic processes is a special adaption that appeared in evolution during the formation of annual cycles for formica type, or the strategy of concentrated development could arise only in ants that already had a high rate of development as a pre-adaption. Chapter 6. Review of Heterodynamic Annual Cycles in Ants Chapter 6.1. Seasonal Cycles of a Phenogaster Type For the first time, the seasonal cycle of the ants a Phenogaster was described in the works of Headley, who counted the quantitative composition of 46 colonies 
of a Phenogaster fulva in Ohio and recorded that eggs and larvae of all sizes remained in the nest for hibernation. This data was confirmed by Talbot, who conducted research on a Phenogaster fulva and a Phenogaster rudis in the more southerly state of Missouri, and much later by Mizutani and Imamuri on a Phenogaster japonica in Sapporo, Japan. We found and investigated this annual development cycle on an Aphenogaster sinensis from southern Primory, Russia, Aphenogaster gibosa from southwestern Turkmenistan, and also Aphenogaster subterranea from Crimea, and suggested to separate it into particular types. Apparently, it is typical for the whole genus Aphenogaster in three species studied by us. Apparently, it is typical for the whole genus of Phenogaster. In three species studied by us, a diapause of larvae of the last or third instar arises at the end of summer. However, queens continue to lay until late autumn. Thus, they do not have diapause. Therefore, eggs and larvae of all three instars stay in the nest for overwintering. At least some of the eggs and junior larvae hibernate successfully both in the laboratory and in nature. We confirm this fact during excavations of nests in the south of Primory and in the western Kopeg Dag of Turkmenistan in early spring. In accordance with our data, the same seasonal cycle is typical for Tapanoma erraticum, Tapanoma caravayevi, and possibly for some Mesa species in Turkmenistan as well as Temnophorax species, although in all these species, eggs cannot so successfully overwinter. Thus, of all the currently known ants from the temperate climate going on hibernation with eggs, they probably overwinter happily only in a Phenogaster species. The incapacity of the eggs for hibernation is an obvious consequence of the impossibility of diapause onset at this ontogenetic stage in the ants. Our experiments with the colonies of Lepisiota seminovi, Lassius niger, Myrmica rubra, Myrmica ruginodis, and Plagiolepsis compressus, which during summer we placed into a refrigerator with a temperature of 3 to 5, have shown that the eggs of these ants died at low temperatures for two or three weeks, and of course they could not survive for a fairly long winter in a natural habitat. Despite this, in the subtropics, and in areas with a very warm temperate climate, where winters are mild and short, seasonal cycles of a phenogaster type, which are characterised by the absence of queen diapause and overwintering with eggs and larvae of all instars, are likely to be widespread among ants. This is confirmed by some data. Thus, living in the subtropics, Polyrachis species, Solenopsis species, Rhinotoponera species, and along with many others, always overwinter with eggs and all instar larvae. The presence of eggs and larvae of all instars in the nest during the winter, and even the ovi position of the queen at low autumn and winter temperatures, are noted for Leptophorax niger species and Leptophorax rhalus, and the Temnophorax racidans in the south of France, in a very warm, temperate climate, almost subtropical climate. Therefore, it seems obvious that the heterodynamic annual cycles of a Phenogaster type are of subtropical origin. Some species can later penetrate into areas with a warm, temperate climate while retaining the subtropical structure of their cycle. However, in this case, eggs perish during the overwintering period due to more severe winter conditions. Most species of Aphenogaster, including those studied by Headley and Talbot, are also confined to the tropics and subtropics. It can be assumed that some representatives of this genus, which have spread from the subtropics to areas with colder and more prolonged winters, evolved some physiological mechanisms that increased the viability of eggs at low temperatures. To ascertain their nature, special investigations are needed. Thus, according to the literature and own data, 
In addition to Aphenogaster species, the same seasonal cycle is typical also for some species of Leptophorax, Mesa, Polyrachus, Rhytidopanera, Tapanoma and Temnophorax, inhabiting areas with a subtropical and warm temperate climate. Chapter 6.2 Seasonal Cycles of Myrmecotype The first studies of the annual cycles of such type were fulfilled in the USA by Headley on two Leptophorax species and by Talbot on two Temnophorax species and another unknown species. Then, Pesera studied in detail the seasonal development of Plagiolepsis pygmium in South France and Sanders investigated three Campanotus species in both the south of Canada and the south of France. Also, Myrmica rubra in Belgium, Paratrichina flavaleps in Japan. They were all studied in the same detail. The first study, in which the annual cycle of development was observed in the laboratory, belongs to Brian. He maintained two colonies of Myrmica rubra and Myrmica rugonodis in artificial conditions closest to natural. Later, he investigated the growth and development in several colonies of the same species, founded by females, before the production of elates. The developmental cycle of Plagiolepsis pygmia and a number of Leptophorax species were studied in much greater detail. Plateau kept the colonies from their initial queen until eventual queen's death and colony extinction, about 5 to 12 years, and recorded the complete ontogeny of all the colonies. Similar studies have been conducted on Mesa Syriacus and Mesa Incorporatus and Mesa Barbarus. Based on literature data, we can include in Myrmecotype the seasonal developmental cycle of European species. The larval stages on which the diapores can occur are extremely variable among ants. With Myrmeca and Aphenogaster types of annual cycles, five groups can be distinguished according to their instar composition of overwintering larvae. Chapter 6.2.1 Diapores in early instars Lepisiota, Plagiolepsis, Tapanoma, and some Campanotus. Larvae of the first three instars hibernate in Plagiolepsis pygmia, according to Pesera. Our data from Plagiolepsis calvus, Compressus, Karawajui, and Vladileni are completely consistent with this conclusion. In Tapanoma erraticum from France, most of the larvae hibernate at the first instar and only a few at the second and third. We found the same in Tapanoma erectum and Tapanoma caracavelli from Turkmenistan. We also observed the hibernation of the first and second instar larvae in Leposota seminova from the same place. Diapause in early instars is also typical for many Campanotus species. Larvae of the European Campanotus vagus always hibernate in the first instar. Minster observed the same in incipient colonies of seven American Campanotus species, under laboratory conditions as well. Chapter 6.2.2 Diapause in the middle instars Sanders indicated that in Campanotus herculanus, Novoborensis and Pennsylvanicus, living inside tree trunks in southern Canada, hibernating larvae could be divided into two distinct size classes, i.e. they were clearly of different instars. We observed the hibernation of larvae of the second, third and in a small number of the fourth instars in our experiments on Campanotus herculanus, Japonicus and Lignoperda, all belonging to the same subgenus of Campanotus S. Str. The first instar larvae never overwintered. In the natural nests of Campanotus herculanus in early spring, we also found mainly larvae of the second and third instar, but did not find larvae of the first and fifth instar at all. Chapter 6.2.3 Diapause in the late third and fourth instars. Harpagazinus, Leptophorax, Temnophorax and Mesa. According to the literature data, 
the larvae of Mesa incorporatus, hibernate in at least two instars. De Lague noted that among the overwintering brood of Mesa capitulatus as well, there were no larvae in the first instar. In the laboratory, we observed the hibernation of Mesa denticulatus, Mesa intermedius, Mesa subgracilinodus, and Mesa structure, and found that their larvae overwintered in the last, third, and fourth instars. In the nests of Mesa denticulatus and Mesa structure from Turkmenistan, in the early spring, we found only larvae of the last two instars. Our investigations demonstrated that in Leptophorax and Harposenus sublevus larvae, they hibernated in the first, in the third and fourth instars as well, and the larvae of the latter instars were clearly predominant among them. Only very rarely single larvae of the second instar could be found in overwintering colonies of these species. Only very rarely single larvae of the second instar could be found in overwintering colonies of these species. Larvae of Temnophorax may hibernate at all three instars, but larvae of the last instar obviously predominate among overwintering ones. Chapter 6.2.4 Diapores in the last, usually third instar, Manica, Manica, Diplohoptrum, Leptanilla, Monomorium, Myrmica, and Tetramorium. Only larvae of the last instar hibernate in all Myrmica species studied. Our studies on eight Myrmica species confirmed this. Larvae overwintering in the latter instars, also in Leptanilla japonica, which inhabit a subtropical region of Japan. Our research work allowed us to supplement this group with the following species. Monomorium gracilium, Monomorium ruski, Manica rubida, Solenopsis salani, salatum, Solenopsis fugax, and all Tetramorium species. Larvae of the ants hibernating at the last instar are, for the most part, far from the completion of development, i.e. they are at the beginning or in the middle of this stage. To achieve the size of for pupation, they usually need a fairly long period of growth after overwintering. This fully applies to the largest of overwintering larvae that develop in spring into a late reproductives. An exception to this rule is Leptophorax acevorum, and probably other species of the same subgenus, in which many of the larvae of reproductives almost complete their development before winter. Chapter 6.2.5 Diapause in all of 3 to 6 instars, sometimes except the first instar. This applies to Phenogaster, Cremogaster, Lassius, Paratrachina, Campanodus, and Tanamermex. An exact study on the instar composition of overwintering larvae of Campanodus aphiops in France showed that 85% of them were larvae from the first and second instars, 5% of the third to fourth instars, and 10 to 15% of the fifth instars. The results of our experiments and spring evacuation of nests in nature confirmed that the overwintering brood of this species was represented by larvae of all instars except the first. With the obvious dominance of the second instars, we have shown that the larvae of Campanotus bactrianus and Campanotus circes, species of the subgenus Tanamermex, are well known as well, also hibernated in all instars except the first. Perhaps this feature is typical for the entire subgenus. Chapter 6.3 Seasonal Cycles of the Formica Type According to the literature data and our own observations, this annual cycle is typical for ants of the entire tribe of Formicini, Orlophormica, Cataclyphus, Formica, Proformica, and Rosomermex. This fact was firstly determined by Holmsquist on Formica ulci, and later repeatedly confirmed by other researchers on the same and other Formica species, including Formica fusca and Formica japonica. 
Annual developmental cycles of ants of the subgenus Formica S. Str have been studied in detail by many authors. There is also detailed experimental data on Cataglyphus cursor. Many species of genera Oliformica, Cataglyphus formica, and Proformica have been studied in Central Asia by Dluski. The seasonal cycle of the slave maker and Rosomermex proformicarum in the deserts of the Republic of Kazakhstan were also described by Mariakovsky. Our experiments and field observations made it possible to add to this list. Outside the tribe of Formicinae, annual cycles without wintering brood were found in Dolichodorosus. Outside the tribe of Formicinae, annual cycles without wintering brood were found in Pogonomermex oxaledentatus and Pogonomermex montanus. Also, Prolinopsis imparis from the north of Florida. They also overwinter without brood, but has a completely special annual cycle. These ants are active outside the nest and foraging from November to March, i.e. during the winter months. For the rest of the year, the nests are closed. During the foraging period, workers inside the nest accumulate reserve nutrients in the form of fat and gradually become phytogastric. In spring, their mass exceeds the normal by two or three times. During spring and summer, the ants stay in their nests in an inactive state. In September, the queens lay a large number of eggs, and then their ovaries become dysfunctional. The ants feed the larvae emerging from the eggs only at the expense of their fat stocks from the phytogastric workers. Both workers and winged reproductives grow up from this single batch of brood. By the time of resumption of foraging, there is no brood in the nest. We found the annual cycle of formica type in Ponera coatrata from the southern coast of Crimea. Investigations of several dozen nests in early September demonstrated that brood, except for a small number of pupae, was no longer present in them. In the colonies transferred from natural nests, to the laboratory, the eggs did not appear even when the ants were kept at a long day photo period and a temperature of 25 to 28 Celsius for two months. Thus the reproductive diapause of the queens in this species was as stable as that of formica ants. According to Talbot, Panera pensylvanica in Missouri, the subtropics, also hibernated without, without brood. Similar seasonal cycles were described for another ponorine ant, Odontomachus bruneus from the north of Florida, the subtropics. This species spends half of the year from November up to April without any brood in its nest. This allows for us to assume that the queens of Odontomachus bruneus have winter reproductive diapause. Chapter 7. Two types of regulation of heterodynamic annual cycles. This is where it gets really good. The main characteristic feature of homodynamic and quasi-heterodynamic types of annual cycles is a purely exogenous control of their development, and the key factor is environmental temperature. Heterodynamic species have a much more complex regulation of seasonal development, usually based on a combination of exogenous and endogenous mechanisms. We divided all heterodynamic ants into two groups, which differ substantially in the principle of the regulation of the annual cycle. Exogenous heterodynamic species and endogenous heterodynamic species. The first of them is characterised by the possibility of continuous and unlimited development under optimal conditions. The diapause is optional and occurs only when the temperature is lowered. Such annual cycles we call exogenous heterodynamics. They are typical for all species of the genera Mesa, Monomorium, Solenopsis and Tetramorium we have studied and also for Campanotus xerces and Tapanoma caracavelli. At temperatures above 25 Celsius, as well as at diurnal thermal periods of 20 to 30 Celsius, they all behave like true homodynamic species. Under these conditions, we observed 
continuous development without any signs of deterioration in the experimental colonies for two or more years. At the same time, at temperatures below 23 to 25 Celsius, the egg laying and larval pupation soon stop, or only pupation in some species of mesa, which can hibernate with eggs. At the same time, at temperatures below 23 to 25 Celsius, the egg laying and larval pupation soon stop, or only pupation in some species of mesa, which can hibernate with eggs, i.e. development finishes under the influence of suboptimal temperatures. If the temperature is then raised, the development will resume after a while. However, it can again be blocked below it by lowering the temperature and once again stimulated by its increase. Similar experiments can be repeated with the same colony of ants many times and oft with the same results. Thus, exogenous heterodynamic species is distinguished by faculative winter diapores in larvae and queens. Developmental delays in a colony are purely exogenous and ensue as a straight reaction to the influence of external environmental factors, primarily of temperature when it becomes not optimal for the development. Moreover, inhibition of development is unstable and easily disrupted when the temperature rises. However, this is not a state of elementary quintessence as in species with quasi-heterodynamic annual cycles, because this kind of diapause starts when the environmental temperature is still significantly higher than the development threshold. Another essential feature is that the diapause rises not directly after the temperature declines, but with some lag. Additionally, this diapause is invertible and may be terminated or induced again several times by consistent rising or decreasing temperatures, but each time with a little delay. The second important property of exogenous heterodynamic species is the distinct change of their reaction to temperature during overwintering as a result of cold reactivation. After natural overwintering, or after exposure in a refrigerator to 3 to 5 Celsius for 2 or 3 months, the development and pupation of the larvae recommences and proceeds for a long period at 20 Celsius and even at 18 Celsius in some tetramorium. This difference in the reaction to temperature is another indication of the existence of diapores in exogenous heterodynamic species. Most of the ants from the temperate zone belong to the second group of these group of species which is characterized by endogenous heterodynamic annual cycles. The diapause arises due to internal factors, an endogenous timer, and no external conditions can prevent it, even under long day conditions and optimal temperatures, including the diurnal thermal periods, which are the most favorable thermal conditions for ants, the development in colonies of these species necessarily ceases, and the phase of dormancy in the annual cycle begins. Thus, the diapause of endogenous heterodynamic species is obligatory for the colony which has an internally limited intrinsic seasonal cycle of brood rearing. External environmental factors such as temperature and photo period also participate in the regulation of annual cycles of these species, playing a corrective role, i.e. in varying degrees adjusting the duration of the cycle to the climatic peculiarities of the particular summer season, but the regulation of the cycle is still based on processes that are endogenous for the colony. According to our data, the following species living in temperate climate belong to the group with endogenous heterodynamic annual cycles. These are Aphenogaster, Campanotus, Cataglyphus, Cramagaster, Formica, Hypozenus, Lassius, Lepisiota, Leptophorax, Manica, Myrmica, Plagiolepsis and Panera. The gradual decrease of a colony's capability to produce new eggs and to grow up non-diapausing larvae takes place during the summer season. At the same time, there is the increase of the bias for diapausing as a consequence of the ongoing endogenous physiological and social processes. Moreover, the ant colony gradually acquires this sensitivity to the day length, to the photo period. 
The increasing photoperiodic sensitivity of a colony strongly changes the reaction to temperature. Because of these processes, at the end of the summer, the decrease of temperature with the shortening of the day length, in some species only, contribute to the onset of diapause, thereby reducing the period of egg laying and larval development. The same impact of external factors to the colony's life cycle was found in all species that we studied. So, the duration of a colony's annual cycle of brood rearing in nature is controlled both by an endogenous timer and by exogenous environmental cues such as temperature and photoperiod. These environmental conditions adjust the date of diapause onset to the climatic features of a given year. Temperature control of diapause is the most universal in ants. The higher temperatures delay the onset of diapause both in larvae and adults, whereas the lower temperatures always accelerate the process of the beginning both in larvae and adults. On the contrary, photoperiodic control of diapause is unexpectedly uncommon among ants. For the first time, the photoperiodic response were revealed in Myrmecarubra and Rugonodis. It has been shown that the diapause in larvae and queen appeared more quickly when the day length was decreased in the range from 16 to 13 hours. The diapause both in queens and larvae ceased when inactive ant colonies in autumn conditions were exposed to day lengths of 15 hours. Despite extensive investigations, studies have shown that apart from Myrmica, only a few ant species used photoperiod as an ecological cue which controls all life processes in a colony. Development, oviposition and diapause onset. We have found that photoperiodic conditions affected the induction of diapause only in Phenogaster sinensis and Lepisota seminovi. Additionally, we have observed higher incidence of diapause in larvae under short day conditions than in larvae under long day conditions in Camponotus herculanus, Leptophorax, Acervorum and Manica rubida. Thus, the genus Myrmica represents a rather curious exception among temperate ants, since all Myrmica species studied so far possess clear-cut photoperiodic responses which control the induction and termination of diapause. No fucking way. Thereby, the seasonal development of most ant species from temperate climate regions depends on inner timing in combination with environmental temperatures. This triggers the onset of diapause. The environmental factors can modify the duration of the seasonal brood rearing cycle within broad ranges in most species of the genera Aphenogaster, Cremogaster, Lassius, Myrmica and Tabanoma. For example, suboptimal temperatures of 17 to 20 Celsius and short days vastly bring closer the beginning of diapause in larvae and queens of Myrmica rubra and Rugonogus, whereas long days and temperatures of 25 Celsius, egg laying and the development and pupation of rapid brood larvae continues for several, several months without interruption. The seasonal cycle of egg laying and development in other species is controlled predominantly by an endogenous mechanism. In these ants, the moment of diapause onset depends only slightly on environmental conditions. Temperature hardly modifies the intrinsic length of all queens' OV position period in all studies of Formica species. The annual brood rearing cycle of Cataclyphus species and the species of the sh subgenre Camponotus S structure, or whatever it is, STR, and Leptophorax STR, is also relatively independent to the environment. Chapter 8 The Regulation of Diapause in Larvae. The diapause of larvae in ants is faculative in most cases, i.e., a given larvae can either develop directly or fall into diapause, depending on the circumstances. Chapter 8. The Regulation of Diapause in Larvae This bit is, like, written <laughs> bloody awful. So I'm just going to short, like, shorten it down to some larvae put themselves to bed and other larvae get put to bed by the workers. Chapter 10. I've skipped the others because, uh, my God, this thing's too long already. 
But in conclusion, most tropical ants demonstrate homodynamic development. They do not exhibit any developmental delays and all year round, the ontogenetic stages from egg to pupa exist in their nest. Some of the quasi-heterodynamic species have permeated into regions with warm temperate climates, but a true diapause did not evolve. In these species, the brood development stops only at temperatures falling below the developmental threshold, so the ants spend the winter in the state of a cold coma, while high mortality rates are observed in the colonies. Most temperate and all boreal climate ants are true heterodynamic, they manifest a true deep winter diapause in their annual cycle. Heterodynamic ants use two main seasonal strategies with respect to brood rearing. The ants are more likely to follow the strategy of prolonged brood rearing. It is distinguished by the following features. Larval diapause is faculative and controlled by environmental and social factors. Only some larvae develop from egg to pupae within the same summer season without overwintering. This rapid brood or summer brood yields only workers. A large proportion of larvae delay their development. They continue to grow in autumn, overwinter in diapause and pupate the next summer. This slow brood or winter brood yields both workers and elates. The strategy of concentrated brood rearing is distinguished by the following features. Larvae have no dormancy and complete their development during the summer. The development of all brood stages is thus restricted to the growing season. Only queens and workers are able to undergo diapause and overwinter. The colony thus passes the winter without brood. This strategy, however, is not the most common. 4. The forms of dormancy which were found in ants extend from elementary quintessence or deep to deep diapause. In exogenous heterodynamic species, the diapause is optional for larvae and queens. The diapause occurs as a result of a direct reaction to the temperature decline in the autumn, but at the moment when the temperature still exceeds the developmental threshold. 5. On the contrary, in endogenous heterodynamic ant species, the diapause is compulsory for the colony and occurs eventually under any conditions. Two main factors restrict and control the internal brood rearing cycle in these species. They are the endogenous timer and the environmental conditions, temperature and photo period in some species. But environmental cues can only regulate in some degree the moment of the onset of diapores by accelerating or delaying this event. All cold climate ants have adult diapores so that their queens and workers are capable for overwintering. Queens and some workers experience diapause several times in their life. On the contrary, the ability of larvae to undergo diapause is not universal in ants. This is a major factor in seasonal cycle evolution in these insects. 6. The diapause of larvae in ants is faculative in most cases. Temperature can affect the larval development and in, in induce diapores both directly and through the nurse workers. The larvae appeared to be entirely insensitive to the direct influence of the photo period. The forms of social impact on larvae diapores by workers are diverse in ants and range from nearly absolute control. When the physiological state of the worker completely defines the fate of the larvae, to rather weak effects when in experimental conditions diapausing workers were unable to prevent the development of most overwintered larvae and spring workers are only capable to induce pupation of only a few diapausing autumn larvae. We could conclude that the similar seasonal adaptions could arise in ant evolution independently many times and usually are not tightly bound to the taxonomic position of the species. Nevertheless, several examples of certain seasonal cycle traits, clearly confined to specific ant taxa, have been found.